I'm on my way down to Gloucestershire to meet Dale Vince, uh, who runs a firm called Ecotricity, one of the big renewable energy firms, uh, and he has loads and loads of wind turbines up and has done uh, a very good job of getting renewable energy into the infrastructure in the UK. He's building an electric car, which we're all really excited about, and I'm on my way to talk to him about it. Just on my way to Ecotricity, and ironically enough, I'm running past the chimneys that are working on behalf of Empower, sending all that carbon into the sky that everyone's worrying about at the moment, and going to talk to someone about renewables and renewable electricity and wind farms and so on. It's a beautiful day for watching smoke go into the sky, look at that. How are we going to power all these electric cars? Yeah. So I'm very happy because I'm sitting with Dale Vince, the guy who started Ecotricity. And he's got a very interesting story. But the amazing thing about him is that he has started to build a wind-powered car. And lots of people are interested in this car, Dale, especially on the bloggersphere or whatever. Yeah, you know, they want to talk about it. Yeah, they I'm look at your that. blog and yeah. everyone's yeah. excited to hear the story. And it's all over the world, you know. This could be a, a, an exciting thing that you're doing. It's a lot of fun. What I want to do is just have a chat with you about where it started, because your story is, is a good one. You know, mm. living out in the middle of nowhere um, with, a, with a turbine on your roof and then deciding to set this incredible business up that has done enormously well and mm. is, you know, paving the way for renewable energy. Just give me your story. Oh, what, like the short version? Yeah, give me the short yeah. version. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I lived my life um, <clears throat> kind of unconventionally, dropped out when I left school. Uh, you know, didn't want to have a, a, a job and a mortgage and a house and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I traveled around pursuing a low impact lifestyle and I did this for about a decade. And then in the early 90s I was living on a hill outside Stroud using a small windmill to power this trailer that I lived in. An old army trailer with some train batteries underneath it from a scrapyard and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, guess, I guess I had a eureka moment. I thought, well, I, you know, I'd, I was living a very low impact lifestyle personally, but I thought I could do more if I dropped in and tried to build big windmills. I saw the first wind farm built in Cornwall in 91. And I guess that inspired me, triggered me to think, well, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's see what we can do. Living on a hill, I knew it was windy because I had a small windmill and I thought well, I'll start here, try and build a windmill. And that was just the beginning of the journey. And that was, you know, 15 or more years ago now. So, and here we are today. Uh, we invented green electricity back in the mid 90s as a, as a concept and a product you couldn't buy anywhere in the world. And, um, yeah, we brought a lot of change to the electricity industry already. And so a couple of years ago, we were talking to Lotus about building um, wind turbines at the, at the factory in Norfolk to, to wind power what they do. And um, it was a bit of a long shot, I thought, but I said to these guys, you know, do you fancy building me an electric car? And uh, that was the start of my EV journey, uh, the, one I'm, you know, the one I'm on now. That's a great story. Well, Lotus are an interesting firm because they do, they've, got, they've got their hands in so many EV projects, it seems. Mm, they're, like, mm. they're one of the forerunners of what's happening with EVs. Yep. Yet, they don't have their own EV, mm. which is weird. What's going on there? I don't think they have the money for it myself. Uh, I think in the cars that they make, they've got an ideal platform for EVs. This was our thinking. We thought, what do you need? You need a small, lightweight car. But we, we wanted something that was fun as well. We wanted to make a sports car um, because I think it's an important part of the message for people that actually you can um, you can be green and have fun, and uh, so you know, say so we had this chat to Lotus, and I think other people have done the same. They've gone to Lotus and said, "You seem to have a great platform, and you know, can can you EV it for us?" In the end, we didn't go forward with Lotus for you know, lots of reasons I won't go into. Uh, we're still friends. There's nothing nothing bad going on, uh, but I think the Tesla thing came along and kind of uh, took their attention, and uh, so we assembled a team of. Um, crack engineers. I like to think of them like the A-team of motorsport. These guys build Le Mans 24 cars, concept cars. Peter Stevens, the designer, he, he designed the Mercedes McLaren F1, you know, fantastic car. And we assembled this team about five people and, um, and uh, said, you know, let, let's look at the, 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 the concept of a retrofit. Take a Lotus off the road and it, uh, we bought a second-hand one. And uh, what, you know, what, what do we have to do to, to make it into an electric car? But not, not just rip out the engine and put in some motors and batteries. But what we're trying to make is a fantastic car, a car that handles better than the standard Exige that we've based it on. The car looks very different because you don't need all the, uh, all the air ducts and, and body shapes you have in an internal combustion engine car. 
for an electric car. So we're changing the body shape. We'll make it more slippery in the process. That's part of what Peter's doing. And, and uh, in the process of that, it'll just look very different. We made it longer to accommodate stuff in the boot. We changed the balance of the car from front to back to make it more optimum in terms of its handling. We're changing the shocks. Um, it, it'll handle better than a standard Exige. It'll be faster than a standard Exige. And then part of our brief was not, we didn't want to make a, an electric car that destroyed the sports characteristics of the Lotus. F1, you know, fantastic car. And we assembled this team about five people. And, um, and I said, you know, let's look at the, the, the concept of a retrofit. Take a Lotus off the road, and it, uh, we bought a second-hand one. And uh, what, you know, what, what do we have to do to, to make it into an electric car? But not, not just rip out the engine and put in some motors and batteries, but what we're trying to make is a fantastic car, a car that handles better than the standard Exige that we've based it on. The car looks very different because you don't need all the, uh, all the air ducts and, and body shapes you have in an internal combustion engine car for an electric car. So we're changing the body shape. We'll make it more slippery in the process. That's part of what Peter's doing. And, and uh, in the process of that, it'll just look very different. We made it longer to accommodate stuff in the boot. We changed the balance of the car from front to back to make it more optimum in terms of its handling. We're changing the shocks. Um, it, it'll handle better than a standard Exige. It'll be faster than a standard Exige. And then part of our brief was not, we didn't want to make a, an electric car that destroyed the sports characteristics of the Lotus. Okay. Um, why, why a car? Why did you do it? Well, uh, I suppose I've been working um, <clears throat> all these years on energy because the biggest single source of climate change in the UK is the way we make electricity. So it was like my first target when I dropped in, trying to change the way electricity is made in the UK. And uh, I love cars, I love motorbikes, you know, I'm a bit of a petrol head, uh, I'll freely admit that. And, um, and a lot of things concern me, have concerned me all my life uh, around sustainability, how we, how we live and how we're going to live in the future, uh, post oil and that kind of stuff. I've been living for that moment since I was about 12 or something. And um, I just had the opportunity, really, to say, well, look, you know, the energy mission is, is, is working. Things are changing. Things are happening. Somebody needs to be talking about cars, more than talking, doing. And a couple of years ago, you know, all the big car companies were talking about hydrogen fuel cells and um, hydrogen economies. And, you know, they needed a decade or two decades to make something work. And, and I just thought, well, that's, that's bullshit. And, um, you know, somebody's going to have to get in there and, you know, uh, make a car and show what can be done. So our aim really is to throw down a gauntlet to the big car company, say, look at us, we're a tiny little electricity company, you know, we made this fantastic car. We haven't invented any new technology. We've, we've found stuff from around the world and put it together. And uh, if we can do it, why can't you? What are you waiting for, you know? And I think it's because they have a vested interest in an internal combustion engine, uh, as do the oil companies. I think that's why between them they talk up hydrogen and fuel cells and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it was a mixture of um, a long-held concern and the opportunity to, uh, to venture into transport and say, let's make a demonstration car you know, and have some fun along the way. And also, I want to stimulate a debate. I want people to start thinking, how will we be getting around without oil? Because oil has been this incredible thing for our generation and a few before us and maybe one more to come. It's, been, it's incredibly energy dense uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's allowed fantastic things and lifestyles. But that's coming to an end, and we've got to think about that very hard and, and start to do stuff about that now before it's gone. You know, it's important what we invest our last barrel of oil in, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I started vlogging <clears throat> in May 2005, getting the G Wiz, driving around in that. The NICE was becoming available. There were only two EVs on the road. Everyone had plans then. So we were waiting for the Subaru R1e, we were waiting right. for the Mitsubishi IMF, you know. Uh -huh. They were all coming out in 2007, it's all very exciting. All right. Here we are, it's 2008. There's yeah. nothing available. Mm -hmm. Nice went into administration last week. Oh, did they? Yeah, they've yeah. gone down. There's one EV company left in Britain, really, you know, successful one, which is going green. They still sell the G Wiz. They're still doing okay. But what's the deal? What you know? You mm. hear, I mean, I can't even get to drive a smart EV, and I've been talking to smart to smart for ages. Right. And uh, I've driven most EVs, but never the ones that are here in the UK, supposedly. They're oh. supposed to have a hundred on trial in London. Never see them. Huh? So, yeah, absolutely. It's great that someone out there is, is saying, look, this can be done. This is the way we do it. Mm. And go out and do it yourselves. <laughs> Let's talk about the technology in the car a little bit as well. Mm, sure. I, I think, are you using lithium polymer battery? Yeah. In it? We are, yeah. So why are you pursuing that not lithium iron out of interest? Is there a reason for that? And just our engineers um, kind of 
balance of a number of factors, you know, weight, power, cost, and all that kind of stuff. And we, we set ourselves performance goals uh, for the car. And I think we, we just basically concluded lithium polymer was the, the best battery to achieve those. Um, we wanted to top 100 miles an hour. We figure that's a kind of emotional watershed, you know. We want people to take this seriously as a car. And if we, if we can say there's more than 100 miles an hour, people say, oh, yeah, that's a car, you know, modern petrol heads, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's going to have a very fast 0 to 60 time, of course, you know, EVs yeah. do. And, um, and a range of about 150 miles. We chose 150 miles specifically because 99% of all car journeys in the UK are less than 100 miles. So we figured a car that could comfortably do 99% of all journeys is, is going to be a, a, a step up from where we currently are with EVs. Um, and as you see on our blog site, probably we've been kind of visioning about what petrol stations of the future would look like. And we came up, the first vision was like, a, like an internet cafe. You pull in, plug your car in, go and have a cup of coffee, surf the net, you know, half an hour later you might come out fully charged. And a few people raised some really good points. We went away and crunched some numbers and did some thinking and came to the conclusion that actually we won't need um, filling stations in the future. We won't make special journeys to fill up or charge up because 70% uh, of people have access to uh, home parking and they can charge up at home. And for everybody else, all we need is destination parking so that when you go to the supermarket or the car park or if you're on a commute uh, or, or a business meeting, as long as at the other end you can plug in, you can double your range and modern batteries, you know, can be charged very fast. And so we came up with a new vision of a petrol station of the future, that mouldy, run-down shell station that's abandoned and nobody wants anymore. And I think that's how it will be. I think we don't need petrol stations in the future. Yeah. The, the one problem, I think, is, is city living. Because I live in London. I don't have off-street parking. I have to yeah. run a cable across the pavement. It's not yeah, a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You shouldn't really be doing it. But yeah. that's what I do. That's how yeah. I get by. Yeah. And a lot of people living in the cities haven't really got their heads around that. You, don't, you, know, you don't get off-street parking in Hampton unless no. you're a mouldy. Agreed. But you go and park somewhere during the day, do you? Uh, I park in the garage in Westminster yeah. where there is four charging points yeah, and about yeah. 50 electric vehicles that's, so you never get to charge. No, no, agreed. Uh, but that's now. What I'm saying is yeah. that it'll be... Take a parking meter on the street in London. Maybe yeah. one day in the future it'll come combined with a charging post. So where, yeah. where are you putting your money in and you're paying for parking and electricity? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Electromotive are doing a good job up there yeah. by putting charging bays in. And there's like something like 40 charging points in Westminster now. Mm -hmm. So it, it's happening, but I tell you, it's happening really slowly. Yeah. You know, yeah. what are your views on Better Place and all that kind of stuff? Oh, I don't know much about it. I saw something on the Guardian website yesterday, I think, about uh, there, are, there are plans, announcements in Israel and that yeah. kind of stuff. It sounds interesting. I don't know how they're funded or, or what exactly they're, they're yeah, I mean, providing. Yeah, I mean, there's some kind of amazing startup, really, based in, right. in um, Silicon Valley. And uh, this guy, Shai Agassi, has um, basically sold the deal into Israel, Denmark, San, now San Francisco and Sydney. Mm. And he's got big plans for... What is the EVs. deal? Do you know? Well, you, you basically buy... You run a car like a mobile phone, so you pay per mile. And mm -hmm. Nissan, he's done a deal with Renault-Nissan, who will build the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And you will be able to drive the vehicle around, pay per mile, and then swap batteries out as right. you go around. And he's got, he's got a battery replacement system and a charging point system okay. in place. So that's his infrastructure for it. Okay. So it, at the moment, there's nothing there. It's a lot, yeah. you know, there's a lot, lot of talk, talk. going on yeah, yeah. and not a lot of action. Whereas yeah. Electromotive, I have to say, they're, they're yeah. doing it. They've they got, got charging posts. Yeah. They're the yeah. charging posts in London. So, yeah. I, I, you know, there's opportunity there. It's a good UK business. Let's hope that something can happen with that. Yeah, I think um, I think swappable batteries are are, um, are not a good idea myself. I think uh, better to have batteries that you you just charge up in your car. And and the technology is improving. It's getting faster. The charge times all the time. I think the idea of swappable batteries would would mean that um, things couldn't be so universal. I mean, a three pin plug is universal. Yeah. You can just have one with you, but. You know, if you've got a, a Renault with a swappable battery, will it fit a Ford or, yeah. or something? You know, it'd be a problem. And the battery's big as well. I mean, in our car, the battery's weighing a couple hundred kilos. Yeah. I think it's emotional too. Are you really going to drive the same car as everyone else? I mean, you know, I'm into cars too. Yeah. I, you know, you yeah. make a real conscious decision. You know, you yeah. think about what you're going to drive. So that, for me, that's the problem with it. It's like, mm. I don't, you know, you don't want to be limited to one type of car. Everyone makes an emotional choice over what they drive. Yeah. Which is why... I want to be able to buy one of your cars, and what's, what's the deal with that? When are you, you know? Don't know. It's a demonstrator, the first one. We're having a lot of fun building it, and actually we're learning a lot as well. Um, what we said to ourselves at the beginning was if, if, uh, if it went down well and people wanted one, we'd, we'd consider making a limited edition. And that's still, that's still what we think, maybe 10 or 20 of them. We have no idea, really, how popular the idea might be. But um, with the kind of 
it's not quite the demise of Tesla, but you know, there's some, something's going on with them. And um, with that going on, maybe, maybe there'd be more demand, I don't know. But it was only like six months ago, the guy from Tesla was on my blog site saying, you shouldn't bother building your own, you should buy one of ours. And I, I said to him, well look, just let me have a try of it then to prove what you're saying about it, because I, I, I'm skeptical about the range and stuff. And, uh, and if you're right, I'll buy one. And yeah, he went silent on me. And then a couple of months later, you know, laying off half the people. And, you know, will there ever be a Tesla in Britain? I don't know. And if there is, it'll be left-hand drive. And that's, I think that's way less than ideal. So. The guy that was running Think in the UK has left there, left Think and, and has gone over to Tesla to run their European operation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know. You would hope there'll be something in the UK. There's a lot of talk. I interviewed Daryl Siri, who's the guy who was running their marketing mm -hmm. at the Motor Show. He, he left last week right. left the company so they don't have a, they have a heck of a lot of changes going on yeah yeah it's tough isn't it it's obviously tough to try and prove yourself in the world of EV still it shouldn't be but it is I think it would have been tough for them without a recession yeah for sure and I think the car's probably a lost leader it's hard to see how they could sell it for, for that kind of money unless it's just because they've got really cheap batteries because they're joining a few thousand of them together aren't they yeah absolutely we're joining about 96 together it's quite a different kind of uh, outcome yeah Okay, let's talk about, can I ask you how much it's costing you this time? Yeah, I spent a couple of hundred thousand pounds so far. And we expect to spend a little bit more, but you know, not more than three probably. Really? Yeah. Wow, because you know, the Tesla is over a hundred, basically, you know, the Tango is $108,000. So mm -hmm. if you're building a car from scratch with one of the finest designers in the world, yeah. that's not bad value for money actually. It's not bad.